Um, so today I'm going to be introducing the next speaker, Jason Dirks. Jason recently joined PTI as a senior scientist this past month. Um, prior to joining PTI, Jason completed his PhD and postdoctoral studies in the Slavov lab at Northeastern University. During his PhD program, Jason helped develop PlexDIA, which is a computational and experimental framework for increasing the throughput of LCMS measurement through multiplexing. Um, in his postdoctoral research, he applied PlexDIA to single nuclei. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. Really appreciate it. Um, so yes, yeah, so today I'm going to be discussing uh, this process of uh, basically identifying regulators of protein transport using single nucleus proteomics. Um, this is a project that started um, in my first year of a PhD with Professor Slavov. Uh, it's been a long journey. I think it's come to um, this sort of uh, fruition now, and I'm very happy to explain now. So um, I'll first start with some motivation for why we should do single cell proteomics. And uh, that answer is quite obvious to us all. It's that there's variability, functional variability in single cells. Um, for example, in macrophages that are responding to infection, uh, this response is heterogeneous in these cells. And if we were to do single cell proteomics on it, we would be able to link some of this proteomic variability with functional variability. Um, but there's all, obviously other deeper layers of variability that are contributing to this functional variability, such as the subcellular sort of landscape of these single cells. So it's not just the absolute abundances of proteins that are different in whole cells, but it's the spatial organization of these proteins as well. And so this was kind of the primary motivation for why I started doing single nucleus proteomics and single cell, uh, single organelle uh, proteomics. Um, but we quickly found out, you know, that there's this process that's been known for many decades that um, in the early response of, of cells to an inflammatory stimulus, um, these are, you know, cells that are grown in the exact same culture, treated in the exact same way. This process of uh, mediating this immune response uh, by uh, importing pro-inflammatory transcription factors you can, is going to be heterogeneous. And so that's shown here very nicely with this um, this, this assay, so we have uh, with the arrow is a cell that is responding it with high magnitude and it's having this sort of sustained response versus the cell with the asterisk. And so the question would be, you know, what is it uh, about you know, these cells that is causing this sort of, uh, it's these differences in their response? Um, and presumably, you know, this pre-existing variability that happened that was kind of uh, there to begin with might actually describe um, and predict uh, how these cells would have responded to begin with. So if we can sort of identify some of these regulators, we're going to learn things about these biological processes. Um, and so this is how we kind of set out to uh, derive sort of this uh, generalizable approach that maybe we could potentially use single cell or in this case, single nucleus proteomics to identify regulators of protein transport. But we think that this can uh, also apply more broadly to uh, many things. So protein transport in particular is a very complex uh, process. And so we're going to want to establish some expectations at the bulk level. So we know kind of generally what to expect when we analyze our single nuclei. Um, the second thing is obviously we're going to want to quantify this response and sort of distill it um, to a low dimensional representation um, shown here. And so now if each uh, single nucleus is going to have its own associated uh, uh, amount of protein transport that we've basically quantified. And then uh, we're going to use that value and then ask which proteins are correlated uh, to, to this sort of uh, variable response. And we're going to identify some proteins that potentially explain some of this variability. Uh, and so through some of these proteins, for example, protein X might be a protein that is potentially regulating uh, this uh, complex response or tangentially uh, just associated with it. Um, so to answer that question, whether it's uh, a true regulator or not, we're going to uh, validate some of these uh, identifications that we get, some of these potential hits with uh, genetic perturbations, and see if uh, indeed some of these proteins are actually regulating protein transport. Um, so we did this with a model system that's been pretty well characterized. So we have THP1 monocytes. We've differentiated into macrophage-like cells. Um, and we stimulate it with lipopolysaccharides for a very short duration, so uh, up to 60 minutes. And so it's a very short time. So there's going to be very little synthesis and degradation of proteins. Most of the change that's going to happen um, is going to be the result of protein transport if we're analyzing nuclei. 
Um, and we did uh, many different bulk biological replicates. Um, I completely agree with the sentiment of uh, Professor Vitek, which is um, especially applicable for uh, measurements that have very small effect sizes. So having many different biological replicates can really kind of power this analysis and increase your confidence in the findings. So we analyzed the bulk samples with PlexDI and the single nuclei samples with SCOPEDI, which is this uh, method that Luke Curry um, introduced to us yesterday. Um, so SCOPEDI, we're going to analyze our single nuclei with a carrier sample that is maybe 50-fold more abundant than uh, our single nuclei. Uh, and in this way, we're going to be able to identify um, more proteins um, in the single nuclei channels. So starting again with uh, sort of the expectations that we have for the bulk data. So we analyze bulk material, both the whole cells and the pro uh, nuclear proteomes. And kind of just as expected, there's very little change at the whole cell level um, compared to the nuclear level, um, especially at these early time points. So even by, for example, 30 minutes, there's about 9% of the nuclear proteome that's changing versus less than 0.1% of the whole cell proteome is changing. So there's actually huge amounts of uh, subcellular rearrangement that we see occurring in response to lipopolysaccharides relative to the amount of synthesis and degradation that's occurring. Um, and this was like kind of a, a shocking amount of proteins that we found that were actually changing in response to lipo, uh, lipopolysaccharides. And so we have, you know, because this is a variable characterized system, we have uh, very clear expectations that pro-inflammatory transcription factors should go into the nucleus in response to the stimulus. And that's exactly what we find here with um, the expected magnitude and dynamics uh, that's been characterized for many decades, which um, we're seeing about fourfold increase in nuclear abundance of RHEL-A and, uh, and F-kappa-B proteins. Uh, we're also identifying potentially uh, many other proteins that are less well characterized, um, but nevertheless are changing monotonically or at least continuously, mostly continuously, as a function of this LPS treatment. For example, uh, PAX is a protein that's involved in uh, non homologous uh, joining DNA repair. Um, and it's required for the accumulation of other DNA repair proteins, which we also find are increasing in abundance uh, in the nucleus in response. So this is a very rich data set. Um, it's, the effect sizes are quite small, but we've powered this analysis by many different biological replicates and test nested technical replicates. Um, and so we want to look more broadly. There's a lot of some sort of uh, bulk analyses that we did to sort of uh, identify what is happening uh, in response to the stimulus. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, talk about a, a couple of them. Um, the first of which is um, there's this expectation that when you stimulate these cells, um, this has been reported by colleagues, um, uh, that uh, the processes involved in mediating gene expression, such as uh, proteins involved in translation and ribosome biogenesis are typically going to increase in abundance in response uh, to mediate this sort of process. And that's exactly what we see here. So that's kind of expected. What was a little bit less expected um, and has been not really, I've, I have not seen discussed is that there's also this uh, spatial rearrangement aspect to this. So it's not just that these proteins are increasing in abundance, they're seemingly being transported uh, if we look at the nuclear proteome, to their sites of action where they need to be to facilitate their roles. So for example, um, uh, proteins involved in translation uh, are basically decreasing in abundance in the nucleus, and proteins involved in mediating uh, translation initiation or transcription initiation um, and ribosome biogenesis are increasing in abundance in the nucleus. So there is this potential uh, coordinated spatial temporal regulation that's occurring in response to LPS. Um, and it's not just a result of synthesis and degradation of proteins. It's a lot more complex. Uh, and that's seen uh, shown here with error bars associated with the, all the different proteins that correspond to these uh, gene ontology terms. Where in the teal color, these are proteins whose sites of action should be in the nucleus. We find that they are indeed increasing in abundance in the nucleus. And in red are proteins involved in um, more translation associated processes that should be in the cytoplasm, which are uh, systematically sort of decreasing in abundance in the nucleus. Uh, one last thing that I think is also very interesting is that there's this other process that is known to be upregulated um, in response to lipopolysaccharides. So it's um, the ability to me mediate 
this uh, protein transport starts to actually increase, and we find that uh, nucleoporin proteins are increasing in abundance at the whole cell level, typically for almost all proteins. Um, and then that's we see that basically same thing happening in our nuclear abundances too, where they're also increasing by about the same full changes. The only one that is actually decreasing uh, is TPR, which is a negative regulator of uh, nuclear pore complex assembly. So potentially we might be seeing some corroboratory evidence of of uh, this uh, increased uh, nucleocytoplasmic protein transport that's occurring and being able to mediate increased amounts of that uh, by basically sequestering potentially um, negative regulators of that same process. So that kind of brings us to the end of the bulk data. Um, now I'm going to jump into some of the single cell or single nucleus analysis that I did. Um, so the bulk bulk material, what we, what we analyzed this with was PlexDI, and the main benefit of PlexDI, aside from the obvious benefit of uh, increased throughput, is that when you run samples in parallel, and they're only offset in this M over Z dimension, um, they are have the almost the exact same uh, elution uh, times, so retention times. Uh, that can be seen here with these extracted ionochromatograms. And then also we've more rigorously sort of calculated the deviations across channels shown here in red, um, where there uh, is very little deviation for pre uh, precursors that are co-eluting versus what you would get, for example, running the same sample uh, across runs, even after uh, some sort of lowest regression for the retention times. Um, so we have this potential for increased data completeness. And like Luke mentioned yesterday, um, we have this potential to leverage that and run a more abundant sample in parallel with our single nuclei. And in this way, we could potentially identify uh, far more proteins and then transfer these identifications over into the single nucleus channels. Um, of course, we wanted to benchmark the quantitative accuracy of this. Um, and so we uh, took the human nuclei samples. Um, we kept them at a one-to-one -one ratio. And we use a mixed species spike in to sort of benchmark this, where we have uh, yeast spiked in at a four to one ratio. Um, and what we found is that the quantitative accuracy actually is very similar across all levels of carrier amounts. So if we use, for example, if we had no carrier here um, and we intersect these protein identifications and we look at the quantitation for if we had maybe a 50x carrier here, um, the quantitation is actually relatively similar, it decreases slightly, but generally this is showing that um, there's really not much detriment to the quantitative accuracy as a result of loading even really large amounts of carrier. And potentially this is a very unique case to nuclei because the proteome is so simple. If you were to do this in whole cells, you'll probably see uh, a more substantial drop off. But uh, the nuclear analysis is uh, kind of an interesting case where you can load potentially a lot of carrier without too much downside at all. So because um, we have this potential, we wanted to evaluate uh, how, much, uh, how much of a gain it offered. And so uh, if we look at the number of proteins that we uh, identified as a result of this stimulation, we're quantifying about fourfold more proteins with a 50x carrier than we were without a carrier. Um, and the quantitative accuracy for all of these proteins is, of course, going to decrease. But this is considering all these proteins that we're getting in addition. Uh, most of these proteins are going to be highly just very lowly abundant, and so they're naturally just going to have low signal to noise. Um, but because we aren't directly affecting any sort of quantitative accuracy, really, uh, this can be seen as mostly a free gain. And so this is why we chose to use a 25x and 50x carrier uh, for a single nucleus acquisition. So after this was kind of all said and done, we analyzed four different biological replicates spanning many months of uh, acquisition. Um, we uh, accumulated about 3,400 single nuclei, each with about 1,360 proteins per nucleus. Um, and we uh, did some quality control filtering, and we uh, were able to separate out our negative controls. These negative controls were prepared in the exact same way as uh, single cells and single nuclei, um, but they were uh, basically just did not have any cellular material. And we find that we have uh, quite good separation between our negative controls and our real single nuclei. Uh, and so we just retain the ones that typically uh, provide this separation. Uh, there are other layers of filtering that I did as well um, that I think are really interesting that are mostly just applicable to single nucleus analysis because there's going to be added layers of variability, such as the variability of the purity of the nuclei that you get. Um, I'm happy to discuss that later. 
but um, after all the filtering was kind of said and done, we ended up with about 3,000 nuclei with about 1,300 proteins per nucleus. So this is what we're going to use for all of the downstream analyses that I'm going to show. So we collapsed all the data onto their principal components, and we found that we have um, relatively uh, decent partial separation between not treated conditions of LPS treated nuclei uh, versus the uh, very short LPS duration uh, nuclei. We wanted a way, though, of uh, quantifying um, protein transport. And this is actually something that's very complicated with single nucleus analysis. Um, and it's because we're not going to know necessarily uh, what the uh, proteome of this nucleus was prior to its LPS stimulation because it's this destructive process. Uh, and so uh, as an alternative substitute of this, uh, what we're doing basically is we are calculating deviations of protein abundances in each LPS nucleus for each protein against the not treated population. So we're using the not treated population to inform um, how far uh, each of these proteins have basically deviated. And we end up with a vector of these values for each single nucleus for each protein, obviously. And then we weight it based on the bulk data that we got. And so that bulk data is kind of giving some directionality to this, uh, to this data set that we have, kind of uh, encouraging it to be and, and reflect more of uh, what we would expect uh, protein transport to look like. We take the mean component of this vector, and then we call this the transport score. And so this is going to serve as sort of a proxy for uh, quantifying protein transport in single nuclear uh, as, what you, as what you would expect. So we have... Um, now this value, so as we increase the duration of the LPS stimulation, we find that we do have more uh, higher, higher protein transport scores uh, for single nuclei. Each one of these points is a single nucleus. Um, so we then use this. We basically distilled this highly complex uh, function in single nuclei as best as we can. Of course, we're not going to actually measure protein transport, but this serves as a useful proxy. Uh, and now we're going to correlate relative protein abundances back onto this uh, response that we've quantified. And we can identify proteins such as NUP205 that are relatively highly correlated to this process, um, meaning so that more NUP205 there was in these LPS treated nuclei, uh, the more protein transport typically occurred. And oppositely, the more vimentin that these nuclei had, uh, the less protein transport that was experienced by these nuclei. Uh, and we wanted to uh, more so kind of separate out uh, what might be uh, what these associations actually mean, because obviously you can't infer too much just from correlative analyses. Um, and so uh, we're kind of going back to this idea that potentially these cells, what they were like prior to the stimulation is highly predictive of what um, their functional response is going to be. Um, and so we wanted to look and make sure and assess whether the um, pre-existing variability is much greater than the effect of the LPS-induced stimulation. And so that's what I'm showing here for distributions of, rel of these relative protein abundances. For not treated, it's shown in pink, and this light blue is shown in uh, 10. Uh, it, it, this is the 10-minute condition. So there's a very high overlap between these proteins, meaning that uh, a lot of the variability that is the result of this correlation is driven by this pre-existing variability. And it's we've basically avoided any sort of circular association with how the transport score is calculated. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to this idea that there are potentially static proteins in the nucleus that they themselves are not necessarily being transported very much, but their relative abundances are highly predictive of this response. And so this is kind of kind of getting at the crux of that. Uh, and so we did this for all the proteins. We find that the distributions typically have really high overlaps of about 94%. Again, kind of showing that most of these proteins themselves are not really transporting. If they are, it's very low amounts. And that a lot of the uh, abundances that we're getting are just the exact same abundances that they were in the not treated population. So suggesting that uh, these correlations are driven by pre-existing natural variability. Uh, it didn't take long to realize that in this whole sort of spectrum, a lot of these nuclear foreign proteins um, really kind of stood out, and they're all very highly co or relatively highly correlated to protein transport. The only one actually that was negatively correlated was this one that's associated, uh, that's a negative regulator of nuclear pore complex assembly. So this is all kind of complementary evidence suggesting that potentially nuclear pores are uh, really important for mediating uh, you know, this protein transport, which is 
an obvious, you know, sort of biophysical potential constraint. Uh, and it was really cool actually to see it uh, kind of show up in our data. We wanted to more critically kind of analyze this. And so we quantified a uh, nuclear pore, we quantified the uh, number of nuclear pore complexes for each single nucleus by basically collapsing these relative nuclear porin protein abundances. Uh, and we correlated that to the transport scores. And we have a moderate correlation of about 0 0.48 that is highly significant. And this is suggesting that um, that this really complex sort of process is potentially limited by very simple biophysical constraints, such as just the quantity of nuclear pore proteins or nuclear pore compl uh, complexes. Um, so we also found that when we looked at that that sort of distribution of these correlations to transport, they all these nuclear pore and proteins were not necessarily correlated in the exact same way, uh, and so to more uh, rigorously kind of look at that, we mapped it onto the nuclear pore complex and we've color coded the nuclear pore complex based on these nuclear pore associations. Um, and I looked at this a little bit more rigorously and I faceted them based on where in the nuclear pore complex they're located. Uh, and so what we're finding here is that uh, these nuclear porins that are more on the periphery, potentially, uh, such as the nuclear basket and the cytoplasmic region, tend to have lower correlations to the transport score than ones that are more on the interior uh, of the nuclear pore complex, which would be uh, right over here. Um, we kind of collapsed that down a little bit more succinctly and uh, looked at uh, nuclear porin proteins, which are considered peripheral and which are considered scaffold proteins. And there is a significant difference suggesting that these uh, nuclear pore proteins that are you know, more scaffold-like are potentially more indicative of the abundances of actual nuclear pore complexes or are potentially more important for mediating protein transport than ones on the periphery. Uh, naturally, actually, this actually correlates with the protein half-life of those nuclear porn proteins. So if we uh, we, got, we got this protein half-life data from uh, Matheson and all, and we uh, correlated those half protein half-lives to that transport score, and we do find that there is this significant correlation. Um, and again, this potentially is, it's unclear what exactly this means, but likely it's sort of just reflecting that there is this biological variability in these nuclear porn proteins um, and how important they are potentially for mediating protein transport or more likely, um, the abundance of these proteins uh, is more representative of uh, the abundance of nuclear pore complex proteins. So one's scaffold proteins are more likely representative of the true number of nuclear pore complexes. Okay, so um, that brings me sort of to the end of the uh, biological analyses that we did um, for the single nucleus analyses. Um, but now we have sort of this potential to uh, ask the question, uh, what is the difference, or uh, are, are, these, are these other proteins that we find that are not necessarily related at all to innate immunity or uh, to protein transport, are they actually potentially regulating uh, uh, LPS-induced nucleocytoplasmic protein transport? Um, so for example, RBM6 has no known relationship, uh, likewise with IMMT. Uh, and so to answer this question, we're going to knock down uh, the abundance of these 16 different proteins that we chose that fell along that spectrum. And I had a lot of help from uh, a really dedicated undergrad uh, who's recently graduated, Toby. Um, and so we uh, knocked down uh, 16 of these genes, um, did up to eight different biological replicates. It was a massive amount of work. Uh, and then we uh, isolated nuclei from these treated uh, macrophages. So we had LPS treated nuclei and then not treated nuclei. And we needed a way of assessing uh, how that knockdown actually affected protein transport. And so we took the, uh, we had a negative control silencing RNA um, that was run in parallel, or we analyzed basically in parallel with the, um, the actual experimental conditions. And we're going to use that biological replicate for the negative control as uh, sort of a, a guide for what uh, would have been the protein transport that was experienced by these knockdowns. And so we're basically just calculating a change in slope from the negative control to our experimental condition. Um, and we're doing this by regressing the LPS to not treated full changes in the sRNA conditions to the original bulk data I had shown. And using that delta slope, we can now kind of answer this question, uh, are these uh, protein uh, proteins that we found correlated with 
uh, protein transport, are they actually regulators or not? Um, and indeed, the short answer is that yes, these correlations that we found uh, associated with protein transport are um, highly predictive of the effect of uh, nucleocytoplasmic protein transport. So what I'm showing here on the y-axis is we're using all the uh, data that we got from the biological replicates and the consistency in that data to compute a z-score for these correlations that we had. And so that gives sort of a, a confidence in how predictive it is for protein transport. Um, and then we're taking a z-score of these delta slopes across all the different biological replicates uh, that we did. And we find that we have uh, highly significant negative correlation about 0 0.77. So um, indeed, we've potentially used single nucleus proteomics to identify regulators of this highly complex uh, biological function. So uh, to summarize, uh, we identified um, and characterized sort of and quantified this uh, heterogeneous uh, protein transport that's occurring in single nuclei. Uh, we correlated that back to relative protein abundances uh, and we identified proteins that are associated with variability in that function. And then we uh, tested these associations uh, using bulk silencing RNA knockdowns and found that indeed this could potentially uh, be used as a way of um, inferring regulation. And so we think that this is an approach that can be you know, generalized to many other applications um, and have potential uses even in um, uh, and therapeutic target discovery. Um, with that, I would like to thank uh, all the members of the Slab of Lab, uh, especially Nikolai and uh, Toby for all their help, um, Andrew for sample preparation, and uh, all the other members of the Slab of Lab, and thank you all for your attention. Happy to take questions. Um, does anyone have any questions for Chase? Very nice work. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering whether you have noticed a change in cell size, uh, nucleus size, actually, when you are stimulating with LPS, and if that's something that could potentially affect any of the measurements, just thinking about how cell size more generally affects the yeah. depth of the... Yeah. Right. Yeah, so there... I'm not sure if um, the LPS stimulation changed the nuclear size. Um, there was some variability with nuclear size across biological replicates, but it seemed like um, it remains relatively the same size because we used the same gating on the cell in one across all the different conditions. So I think it, it remained about the same size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely a consideration for sure. Really cool talk. Um, can you talk more about DHX15? That was the one oh, that right. enhanced uh, transport, yeah. but it seemed that when you knocked it down, it increased transport. I, that's yep. unexpected. Yeah, it's definitely unexpected. Um, potentially, it was one that could kind of go either way. Either way, it's one that kind of was very little, had very little significance. And again, these are kind of correlations that we're associating. And so because maybe, maybe there's something in this data that wasn't captured with this low dimensional you know, uh, quantif quantification that we did. Um, it was, so of, I have some supplemental slides. So of all the knockdowns that we did, there was about, let's see. Um, so yeah, so uh, of the 16 knockdowns that we did, I believe there were eight, yeah, eight that were significant, um, so significantly differential in their effect. Um, and seven went in the direction that we expected. DHX 15, I'm not sure exactly what's happening with it. It is kind of a curious finding though. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Um, I have two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, can you explain more how to calculate the transport score? Mm -hmm. And another question is, do you have any like uh, fluorescence experiment to validate the some of the target proteins you are interested? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, um, so the uh, transport score is calculated based on the non-treated population, um, where basically we're using that not treated population, there's going to be some 
baseline variability in that population for each protein. So you could think of uh, the relative abundances of those proteins in that population as being somewhat variable. And we're basically calculating z-scores against, against that population for each protein. Um, and so that's going to sort of systematically sort of identify deviations for each protein that's been stimulated with LPS from that not treated population. So you can imagine we get like a vector of these deviations. Um, so basically, it's basically quantifying how 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 different uh, a nucleus is that's been LPS stimulated from a generalizable sort of population of not treated nuclei, and then we weight it based on proteins that were differentially abundant, so that we can uh, more closely uh, reflect. Uh, the aspects of transport that we expect to, to be occurring. So for example, um, if we found that, it's gonna be hard to flip through all these, but if we found that, um, if we found that uh, NF kappa B, for example, should be, uh, you know, maybe a, a couple standard deviations above the, the not treated population, um, it would also have received like a, quite a high weight uh, because it's also something that's differentially abundant um, at the bulk level as well. And so basically you're just kind of compounding a lot of these weights and then summarizing it into a single value that we can manipulate. I'm happy to explain a little bit more uh, after if you don't understand. In regards to um, the fluorescence data, we haven't done that, uh, but it's something that we would like to do, I think. One more very quick question. What's the size of the nucleus? The nucleus, um, it does vary a bit. So, but it usually in these THP1 cells, it was about 10, 10 microns, give or take maybe three microns. Thank yeah. you. Um, the analysis that you did to find proteins that are, you know, uh, facilitating or dampening protein transport is obviously really interesting. One, uh, I, I suppose, limitation is that, of course, these proteins have to be proteins that you measured. So, mm -hmm. ipso facto, they have to be, you know, nuclear proteins that are either facilitating or dampening transport. Yeah. Um, what do you think in terms of the like, outlook for expanding the analysis to ad identifying additional proteins that might be cytoplasmic that also could be facilitating how these proteins are transported? Yeah. So, yeah, you bring up a good point where. Uh... It would be really nice to have uh, complementary cytoplasmic fractions with these nuclei. Um, and if anybody wants to, to jump on board and try to do that, uh, good luck. Um, it seems like a kind of a daunting task, but potentially there's definitely some ways of doing it. Uh, but yeah, to, to answer your question, that would probably be like one of the best ways to do that, to get complementary fractions of both, for sure. This is more of a common, but uh, something that might be worthwhile thinking about is obviously if you have the changes that are asynchronous mm -hmm. in terms of your transport or translocation in and out of the nucleus, and that may be something you're not picking up and just... Um, asynchronous as in... So for example, you could have going back and forth? Of a yeah, so right. Converting, especially with LPS, I can't remember which one of the uh, stimulants does that, but some of them are called... Yeah, I think nf kappa B is a protein that will oscillate, right? So yeah. Just wondering whether there's any way in the future to potentially take some of that into account or not any synchronization of any kind. Yeah, healthcare. definitely. Because you could uh. be underestimating basically uh, the number of proteins that are translocating in and out. And so potentially there's right. still more signal in the noise. Definitely. And maybe in the bulk analysis, this would be less of an issue, but in the single cell, single nucleus analysis, yeah, yeah it would be more of an issue. Um, yeah. Yeah, in the bulk, it would it would probably like average out unless it's like a population wide oscillation, which is unlikely to happen. But uh, in the bulk, yeah, right, it's not a problem. In the single nucleus analyses, it could potentially be a problem. But there's already so many uh, challenges associated with the nu single nucleus analyses because we're not actually measuring temporal dynamics in a single nucleus. It's we're taking snapshots and sort of inferring uh, transport as a result. So that's a good point, though. Can you control for the nuclei purity by the Selen one imaging, or how do you do that? Oh, so evaluate the purity of the nuclei? Yes. So thank you for asking that. Uh, there is, uh, so I went to kind of great lengths to sort of uh, assess the purity of the nuclei that we have. Um, and so what I do is we have, uh, we take the bulk data that we got from the whole cells, and we take the bulk data that we got from the nuclei, 
and you can basically derive uh, proportions of what a protein should be. Maybe a protein should be like 10% nuclear versus uh, the rest of the remainder of the cell. And so, for example, proteins over here would be highly um, non-nuclear. And so we benchmark, we basically fit uh, a third degree polynomial for our nuclear proteomes um, to uh, basically to, to this expected um, reference. And so uh, nuclei that were kind of had a slope of one here would be more whole cell-like uh, versus if it was more so than just a flat line here. Uh, it would be highly pure nuclei. And so uh, we do have some ways of sort of filtering out ones that were relatively impure by just calculating an area under the curve there um, and just selectively removing that. Did you also control for integrity? So the nuclei are uh, intact? Did you also? Yeah, uh, controlling for integrity, I think would have to probably be done. We, we didn't necessarily control for that explicitly, but that would probably also manifest um, in this analysis here, which would we would filter it out. Thank you.